Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Bible says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We welcome you to our morning worship service and so glad that you and the Holy Spirit are with us today. I'm going to hide behind, hide behind the mountain, yeah, I'm going to hide behind, hide behind the mountain. us and to that place where we are confident. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you on this Sabbath day that you have a special place for us to go, a place of comfort and peace, a place of assurance and restoration. And God, it is that mountain, that mountain of love and that mountain of acceptance. And to that place we come this morning. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings us together. Thank you, most importantly, God, for the Holy Spirit that keeps us going. And we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts continue to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength, our most blessed Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, my friends, we invite you to turn in your word to the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 10, looking at verses 38 through 42, uh, part two of this series of sermons as we have been able to look to see what God says to us in the life of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And today I call your attention again to uh, these four verses of scripture from Luke 10 from a New Living Translation. This is what the word of the Lord says. And as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed them into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work. Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these things. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will be taken away. It will not be taken away from her. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And I call your attention to verse 40, 40A of this pericope, for it serves as the backdrop of our preaching moment. For the Bible simply says, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. With the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement, I want to lift up this text today and for a brief moment preach on our subject, misplaced priorities. Misplaced priorities. You know, y'all, with so much happening around us and with so many activity demanding our undivided attention, it should come as no surprise as to how easy it is to get sidetracked off the main thing and sometimes fall for distractions. Let me say it like this, y'all, with so many things in front of us and so many things pulling us, it, it should not come as a surprise that, that, that we are tempted, if not invited, by distraction. But somebody can go ahead and say it with me now. Your body's here with me, but your mind might be on the other side of town. Go ahead, type amen in the chat box if you know what I'm talking about. You see, distractions, my friends, come to us in all different kinds of ways and all different sizes and all different forms. Distractions come at us, y'all, presenting themselves as an opportunity to take a deep dive away from what we should be focused on. For you see, you can be standing and looking ahead and then all of a sudden, tall, dark, and handsome walks right in front of you. That is a distraction, okay? You can be picking up some things at Lowe's or Home Depot, trying to fix things around your house, and then around the corner in the garden section is a 36, 24, 36 brick house who's got you now looking at lawnmowers and weed eaters, and you ain't cut your grass in 20 years. Distractions, y'all. Or say, for instance, you are writing out checks, trying to pay your bills, and then out of nowhere an ad from Amazon Prime vibrates your phone and instead of you paying bills, you making bills. Distractions or you are on your way out for a walk in the park on the greenway or to exercise and for, for the love of creation out of nowhere the red light pops on at Krispy Kreme and your car veers off to the right and your car makes a three point road turn without you knowing it and you have lost all effort of counting your steps and counting your calories and your commitment to Weight Watchers. What you saying, preacher? Distractions. Somebody type distractions right there because distractions, they come at us, y'all, inviting us to get away from the main thing. Distractions, they come at us, y'all, inviting us to move away from what we ought to focus on. Distractions, they look good on the outside, but they can be detrimental to your inside. You see, distractions are part of life and somebody looking at me right now knows exactly what it means to live in a world and a community of distractions. Distractions that take us off of the main thing and puts us on minor things. Distractions that come to us, y'all, by what we now call smartphones and smart devices, because smart devices can sometimes make you do some dumb things. Okay, let me back it up and say it to you a little bit slower. Smart devices, y'all, that are supposed to give us navigation and supposed to give us education, supposed to give us illumination. Smart devices, y'all, can make us do some dumb things. What you saying? Let me illustrate it to you like this. For in Salisbury, Australia, they have implemented signs, y'all, for smartphone zombies. Smartphone zombies are simply people, y'all, who walk in, in the middle of nowhere and out in space and find themselves causing accidents, if not being an accident themselves. In Australia, they have put up signs, y'all, to prevent 
from these accidents happening. But not only have they put up signs, but they put airbags in the street poles, street light poles, and to lamp posts, y'all, because people have a tendency to be so focused on their phone or their smart device that they walk into these, the, the, these structures and hurt themselves. Now understand, how can a smartphone cause you to do some dumb things? Well, simply by distractions. Am I talking to somebody this morning? Because I hope I'm trying to help you uncover that you cannot be all that God wants you to be if you get distracted. You can't go as deep as God wants you to go if you are fooled by distractions. You cannot be the person God is calling you to be if you are fooled by distractions. Let me see if I could give you one a little bit lighter, one you can laugh with. For it is a story is told of a preacher in the South who got distracted, y'all. After preaching a funeral, he was asked to lead the family to the cemetery. So he did. And as he led the family to the cemetery in his car, he flipped on his radio. When he flipped on his radio, he got so engrossed to what he was listening to that he forgot where he was going. He saw a Kmart on the right. He thought about, I need to go to the Kmart to pick up some things, y'all. And sure enough, he led himself right into the parking lot of the Kmart. It was only when he looked in his rearview mirror and he saw a train of cars following him with the lights on that he realized he had been distracted. Am I talking to somebody this morning? Have you done some things that distracted you, took you off of focus, and messed your whole plan up because you look at the little things and not the main things? What are distractions? I like the way that Stephen Covey says, Stephen Covey says that the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. Understand this, y'all, is that if we don't schedule our priorities, then they will, those things will become a distraction. Verse 40 of the text is where we hang out today because it talks about distractions. For the Bible says, but Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. Martha, a servant of Almighty God. Martha, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Martha, the host of Jesus and his disciples. We're talking about at least 13 middle-aged men coming to your house, and Martha wanted everything to be right. The Bible says that she was busy preparing a meal. The Bible says that she was consumed preparing a meal. Recognize, y'all, this story of Mary and Martha and hosting Jesus. Jesus and the disciples, it comes on the heels of the story of the Good Samaritan. What is the Good Samaritan? It's a prime example of how Jesus teaches us how we are to practice hospitality. The Good Samaritan is a story talking about we need to love each other as we love ourselves. The Good Samaritan, it talks about the least of things being helped by those who have the position and the power to help. Let me back it up and say it again. Again, the Good Samaritan story helps us get our priorities intact. And when we get our priorities intact, we don't have misplaced priorities. Let me take a sidebar and just explain to you again the dangers of having misplaced priorities. We are in the midst of a pandemic, a health pandemic that is causing the world to go to its knees, a health pandemic that is causing many of us to change things from our normal to a new normal. And in this health pandemic, when our focus should be about health and a cure of the crisis, many of us are focused on money and getting back to the way things used to be. In the world that we live in, y'all, instead of looking for health, we are looking for money. In the world that we live in, y'all, instead of reaching out to those that need help, we are complaining because we don't have enough spare parts for our iPhone. We are complaining because there are not enough workers in Starbucks to give us our coffee. We are complaining because we have to drive up and get food from the restaurant and can't sit down and eat it in a world, y'all. We have misplaced priorities. Could not help but to 
read the story of Eugene this week. Eugene says as he rode his bicycle all over town, he began to see tent cities pop up all over town. As he began to see what was going on in the community, he saw buildings going up on South End. He saw constructions happening downtown. He saw, he saw high rises being lifted up down by the stadium, but he did not see any homes being built for the homeless. He did not see anybody moving from tent city to a place, even in the midst of storms, hurricanes, and this morning an earthquake. Understand this, y'all, is that misplaced priorities will put the focus on money and not on mission. Am I talking to somebody this morning? The importance that this text helps us realize, y'all, is that Mary and Martha were doing a good thing, but the Bible says that Mary did the better thing. Okay, let me back it up and say that again. The thing that separated Mary and Martha was the emphasis that they was placing on listening to the Lord. The Bible says when Jesus came into Martha's house that Mary found herself at the feet of Jesus. Recognize what this means is that at the feet of Jesus, that's what Paul talks about at the feet of Gamaliel, that's where knowledge takes place. At the feet of Jesus, that's where transformation takes place. At the feet of Jesus, that's where the word is taught. Did not our Savior say that man should not live by bread alone? but every word that proceeds from the mouth of Almighty God. The good news, y'all, is at the feet of Jesus, we get a word. At the feet of Jesus, we get inspiration. At the feet of Jesus, you know that weeping may endure for a night, but your joy comes in the morning. At the feet of Jesus, you recognize that what you're going through, it will not last. At the feet of Jesus, you get your strength and your power to know that all things are possible to those that believe Mary found herself at the feet of Jesus listening. But Martha, according to the text, was in the kitchen trying to get things right. Now, I ain't hating on Sister Martha because every now and then we do need a Martha spirit. Okay, type amen if you know what I'm talking about. Every now and then, somebody's got to get up and do some cooking. Every now and then, somebody need to do some cleaning. Every now and then, somebody need to get the place prepared. Now, don't hate on Martha, because if you got a Martha spirit, you just type amen in the chat room right there. If you got a Martha spirit, knowing that you need to work to get things done, because the Bible says that if you don't work, you don't eat. Okay, come on, help me Bible study. The Bible lets it be known as that work is the precursor to success and success only comes before work in the dictionary. So if you want to be successful, you need to get to work. But Martha, y'all, is putting more emphasis on the work than she is on the word. And before, before, before y'all, you can have an outward service, you need to have an inward worship. Am I talking to somebody here this Sunday morning for God has laid it upon my heart to share with you that before you can have an outward service like Martha you need to have some inward worship like Mary before you can reach out and touch the community and the world you need to have some quiet time with the Lord before you can say I'm going to move mountains I'm going to pull down strongholds I'm going to break some bondages I'm going to break some habits you need to break some time with the Lord you need to have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will hear your faintest cry and answer by and by. You see, the tweet for the week, y'all, is simple. And here it is. I give it to you. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing when it distracts you from the best thing in the presence of Almighty God. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing when it distracts you from the best thing which is in the presence of Almighty God. Do you know the enemy of great is good and many of us are satisfied to be good Christians but not great believers. Many of us have satisfied for mediocrity but we haven't excelled for excellence. Oh, am I talking to somebody this Sunday morning because I need to put it into your spirit. God is 
speaking to you through the Holy Spirit this Sunday morning and encouraging you to move away from good to being better, to not just being better, but being the very best that God has created you to be. Martha, y'all, was good at what she was doing. Mary was good at what she was doing. But Jesus says when he looks at Mary and Martha, Mary has done the best thing that will not be taken away from her. Now, what you saying, Reverend, when you look at misplaced priorities, unless we are keen and exact about doing the best thing instead of good things, we will find ourselves wrapping around and supporting things that bring folk down instead of lifting them up. Okay, let me back up and say that again. Unless we are committed to doing the best thing and not just doing a good thing, we will be victims of misplaced priorities, y'all, and find ourselves holding folk down instead of lifting them up. That is where I take my Genesis point from an article, y'all, written by uh, Professor Jones. Professor Jones wrote an article this week, y'all, entitled White Christians and Christian Americans Need a Moral Awakening. White Christian America Needs a Moral Awakening, written by Robert Jones in the Atlantic Magazine. Here's what he says. He says, in many ways, Christianity has lost sight of Christ. And he's talking to the predominant church, y'all, that has sat back for so long and let things happen without speaking up. Let me say that again. He says that many of us in predominantly white denominations like the Presbyterian Church, the United Methodist, Episcopal Church, Lutheran Church, but many people who are, are what we would call mainline Christians have set back so long and overlooked the opportunity to stand up for what is right. This author says that white Christian churches have not just been complacent and complicit in failing to address racism, rather as the dominant cultural power of the U.S., they have been responsible for constructing and sustaining a project to protect white supremacy. I ain't hating, I'm just stating what the article says. It says that the church that lifts up Christ on Sunday does not lift up justice on Monday. The church that stands for equality on Sunday does not have equality when it comes to living in a, and having a living wage and living in a community of equality. The church, y'all, he says, needs to have a revitalization and a revival. Am I talking to somebody this Sunday morning? Because I believe the church, not just the white church, but the black church needs to take a check up from the neck up and we need to be more intentional with our inclusion Inclusivity. The black church needs to reach out its arms and says, whosoever will, let them come. The black church needs to be more inclusive for people to not judge them by the color of their skin or the thickness of their lips or the width of their hips. Because everybody is a child of Almighty God. I don't care if it's straight hair, nappy hair, kinky hair, or bot store bot hair. It's your hair and it's a gift from all. You are the type amen right there. Because the black church, like the white church, has become complicit and complacent to standing up for justice. And we who are called the children of Almighty God must have an inward encounter before we can do some outward work. Come here, Martha. Help me conclude this sermon by helping me understand what is really going on. There is a tension, y'all, a tension between Mary and Martha just like it is in the church in 2020. There's a tension between some folk who got to be busy being busy, another folk recognize is being in the presence of God that makes all the difference in the world. I've got to give that to you one more time. You see, waiting before the Lord comes before working for the Lord. Waiting before the Lord comes before working before the Lord. And hearing must proceed doing or there could be no direction for duties. Mary finds herself, y'all, waiting and listening for the Lord while Martha, y'all, is busy preparing a meal, check this out, that Jesus didn't even ask for. Okay, y'all missed that. Martha is preparing a meal for Jesus and the disciples, and there is nowhere in the text, y'all, that it says Jesus asked for something to eat. And the problem that many of us fall in with Martha is that we trying to do stuff that the Lord ain't even asked us to do. 
The Bible says that my people who are called by my name, if they will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal the land. The Bible says if my people called by my name will pray for those who hurt you and pray for those who despitefully use you. The Bible says if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, I will heal. Quit trying to do things God ain't asked you to do. You can't be God. Let God be God all by God's self. You see, our attention, y'all, must be not just on how we can be lifted up. We have to lift up Christ in the presence of those who don't believe. The, the focus, y'all, of Martha is not so that we can be so involved in getting our boxes checked and our T's crossed and our I's dotted, but the focus has to be on serving Almighty God. You see, I, I, I'm not hating again on Martha, but a lot of us would rather be in the kitchen with Martha. Because if we're in the kitchen with Martha, we ain't got to hear what Jesus is saying. If we don't have to hear what Jesus is saying, we're not responsible for change. But every now and then, you need to close the doors to the kitchen, get yourself in a place of worship, and say, Father, not my will, but let thy will. Am I preaching to somebody this Sunday morning? God is saying to you, it's time out for you to quit being busy, being busy, and spend time in my word. It's time out for you to stop just being involved in church and now be the church. It's time out for you to stop just talking about it. It's time for you to be about it. This week, this week, this week, I had the honor and the pleasure to preach the eulogy of the oldest member of our church who was laid to rest. And y'all know the story. I call it the Miss Willie Mae Smith story. For she told me some 28 years, the first sermon I preached at this church, she says, Reverend, or better yet, she says, Preacher, you're a pretty good preacher. But I want you to know, young man, I'd rather see a sermon than to hear a sermon any day. And the good news, y'all, is that when you have a merry spirit, then you can act like Martha because you are basically showing your sermon as opposed to talking about your sermon. Let me move quickly and give you these two, and I'll be out of here. For, see, first, when facing the test of misplaced priorities, you need to, you need to recognize that you should not let your temperament distract you or detect the, the agenda. Your, your temperament, your temperament cannot dictate the agenda. Martha had a temperament. Jesus, don't you see what I'm doing? Won't you tell that gal to come in here and help me do some cooking? Her temperament got it all off. Her attitude got it all off. Do you know that God calls you to work? And when God calls you to work, God will give you the strength to work? And don't you worry about other folk who are not working. It may not be their season. It may not be their time. It may not be their equipped to do. But you have to focus on yourself. You see, my confession, y'all, my confession is that I am a kind of a, a recovering workaholic. Work of recovering, recovering workaholic. <laughs> and I have to tell myself that, that being busy is not all that important as it is to being present. You see, we have to realize this, y'all, is that Jesus never looks at our re resume. Jesus looks at our relationship. Jesus is not looking at your resume of the things you do in the church, in the community, in your neighborhood, but he is looking at your relationship that you have with him. And what I found, y'all, is that with my recovering workaholic self, I have to take a checkup and back up every now and then and just ask the question, is this building my relationship with the Lord or is it building up my resume? You see, we have to recognize also is that sometimes there are people who can have a better idea and a better way of doing it and a better approach. Sometimes there is somebody smarter than you in the room. Somebody say amen. And if you are always the smartest person in the room, you need to get a new room. <laughs> you see, 
you need to see that it's, you need to come to grips with the fact that your way is not the only way and the ideas of somebody else might be a better way. And in, in other words, it's always good to hear what other folk have to say. Secondly, when, when you're looking at misplaced priorities, I want you to do, do this, y'all. When life gets complicated, it's helpful to remember that simplicity is the best policy. Keep it simple. I remember my former pastor, Reverend Bhutan, he, he said that his wife used to always uh, give him a little note, a note before he went up to preach. And Dr. Monroe, he, he read it the first time. He didn't really know what the note was. And on the note, it was K-I-S-S. -S. It was kiss. He thought that his wife was being endearing to him, that she blew him a kiss. But, but he went on to preach, and after that he sermon, Dr. Tammy, he went too long. And the wife asked, says, honey, did you see my note? He says, yes, honey, I saw it, and, I, and I, it said kiss, and I thought you was blowing me a kiss as the preacher the other day. She says, no, honey, K-I-S-S -S meant keep it simple, stupid. We need to recognize that simplicity is the way. Simplicity is a way of inviting, but also of engaging. Get, you need to set aside some time to be alone and silent with God. When the pressures of keeping busy have you all inundated, you are very tempted to fall into distraction. Here it is. Please remember, Jesus does not look at our resume as closely as Jesus looks at our relationship. We should not be masterful servants, but servants of the master. And that's all I'm trying to say in this sermon this morning is that we have to stay focused on doing what God calls us to do. We have to stay, to stay, stay committed to doing the will of Almighty God. We have to stay, stay steadfast and know that God is working this thing out. It does not matter how high the mountain you must climb. You must know that God gives you strength to take every step of the way. It does not matter how low the valley is. Do recognize at the bottom of every mountain is a valley so if you in a valley you need to give God praise you're on your way up to the mountaintop you have to remember behind every cloud there is a silver line and yes the hurricanes came through last week but the sun did come out you need to also recognize in the midst of every trouble somebody's going to triumph in the midst of every hurt somebody's getting some help in the midst of every downfall somebody's able to reach out and and pull some. Is there anybody here who would give God a shout of praise right there? Because you are in the midst right now of moving away from misplaced priorities. I close, I close, I close with, with, a, with a story, y'all. The story of uh, uh, Mary a Latitude. A Mary Latitude, y'all, was a businesswoman. And for four years, she ran a successful business. It was a successful business. Her partner was her husband. And on opening day, after preparing everything to open up her business, Mary said that it all hit on upon her that this thing was going to actually happen. She prayed and she prayed and she asked God to give her strength. But she said for four years she prayed and prayed to ask God to give her strength. But in the midst of that business that almost took her out, her marriage out, and her life, she said she recognized as she was praying to give God to give her strength, she was never praying that God would, she would be in the presence of Almighty God. Let me back up and say that again. She had her, had her priorities to be a successful businesswoman, but because she took her priorities off of God who had blessed her with the business. God who had opened up a door for her for business. God who provided resources for her business. God who answered her prayer. Who She prayed God make a way out of no way. God made a way out of no way. But because she was blessed by that, she forgot to stay hooked up with Almighty God. She even said that she asked God for a fresh word, and God simply told her, I can't give you a fresh word if you haven't spent any time in my word. Somebody hear me today. I just want you to realign your priorities. I want you to recognize that God is all that you need. 
in a time of trouble. God is all that you need in a time of a pandemic. God is all that you need. I, I got to say a word to my college students going off. Some have already left home. Some are on their way. I, I need you to know that God is all that you need. Yes, it's a new day, it's a new experience, it's new neighbors, it's new friends, but if you're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, God is still all that you need. God is all that you need, mama, to say goodbye to that child going off to school, daddy to, to release that child into a new environment. God is all that you need. God is all that you need, teachers as you go back to school, students as you prepare to, to do offline, online, in-person, off-person uh, learning. God is still all that you need. I thank you for joining us today. Thank God for our musicians, our technicians, our centurions. Thank God for our health ministry, our COVID-19 team. We are so grateful that so many are contributing to the work of the ministry of this church. Do know I love you, I care about you, I look forward to working with you again next week. May God bless you, may God keep you, may heaven shine upon you. Have a great day. Make it the best day of the rest day of your life. We love you.